Um, all right. So, um, so I will take it on Tuesday if you if you need to to uh, turn it on Tuesday. Okay. And um, yeah, initially, I meant to put something that. Well, let me give it to you, but. Um, I meant to put something that we're going to talk about it today and Monday, but then I figure it's better not to. Um, so. so again, I. I I, I put this disclaimer here that definitely I don't want you to um, use any sort of help um, with breeds, but you can use book, whatever you want to use, um, notes, um, which makes the exam really, really easy. Okay, um, but let me let me uh, mention something about you know maybe the first problem and maybe a little bit about each. Um, so remember we talked about omega limit sets, um, omega limit points for all uh, kind of, um, well for, for planar systems. In fact we said omega limit point is if I have a system you know, and this could be in any dimension. Then, uh, what's a, what's an omega limit point? So, um, and I have x of t as a solution, right? That say starts at um, you know, well, it just starts at t equals zero at some x naught. Then the omega limit set. Um, of x of t is is um, the set of all points. Let's call it Z, such that the solution visits that Z infinitely often and infinitely close, right? So there's there's a sequence of times Tn going to infinity for which x of Tn approaches z. Okay? Now um, In particular, if x at zero is x zero, then we also uh, we sometimes write the omega limit set of x naught is the same thing, right? So it's basically starting with one with initial condition x naught. You have one solution. You know, assuming you have you have a solution, unique unique solution x of t. Says so the same thing, right? So is the all points such that let's use the notation of the of the dynamical system of the flow, right? The flow starting at x naught at time zero and evaluated at t n approaches z for some t n. Okay. Now, so basically, this is saying that if if I have a an initial point here, then I have some sort of solution that, and the solution goes to, um, you know, I'm plotting something like an R three, right? You can have a solution that goes 
this way and then it kind of gets closer and closer and the limit set is going to be therefore um, this limit, right? So it's going to be this limit. Now in R2, in, 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 in the plane, this doesn't really, cannot really happen, right? You cannot have self-intersections. But in R3, it could be, or, or in multi-dimensions, this could happen, right? So the first question here in the, in the exam is, is really saying, like, how about just in one dimension? What's, what's the uh, concept of omega limit set, omega limit point? And what you have to show is that it actually is, um, if there is an omega limit point for a dynamical system, for a solution of a dynamical system, then that has to be a equilibrium, right? Now, this property was always was also encountered in planar systems in two dimensions for what kind of systems? Gradient systems, right? You said if you have a gradient system and you have an omega limit set point, because of that, you know, uh, property of of the potential being decreasing on on trajectories, right? With some um, additional uh, arg arguments, I think we we show that uh, it has to It has to have the gradient of v equals zero at that point, so that point is an is a is an equilibrium point, right? It may not be a stable equilibrium, but it is it is an equilibrium point. All right. So in one uh, D, of course, the the phase portrait, the phase plot, the phase um, space, the phase space, so the space where the um, um, values of x are is just a line, right? So this is the phase line. And um, how can solutions, where, if I have a solution that starts at x0, for instance, where can they go? Z. Okay, yeah, so, so the limit points, right? I think I call Y here. So if I have Y, an omega limit point, <coughs> for the solution starting at X0, then what's the only way it can happen? <coughs> it's an autonomous system. Starting here, it has to approach here, right? As t goes to infinity, so you have to show that this y has to be a equilibrium point. Okay, is it, is it clear? I mean, this this is relevant. I mean, you may not. Have not I mean, we we didn't really pay much attention because um, we didn't we didn't talk about it at that time about. Uh, this limiting behavior, but logistic equation. If you if you remember, this was the first time we talked about it. We said if I start, you know, I have two equilibria, right? Like I have a well, I have a zero, you know, nothing population, and then I have a carrying capacity here. And if I start anywhere in between, it's going it's going to be increasing, right? So the question is, how do I know that it's actually increasing all the way and approaches this? Maybe I know it's increasing, but maybe maybe when you fit the curve with the direction field, maybe it's just can this happen?
Well, this would be a this would be a Omega element point, right? So it must be an equilibrium. So the only equilibrium for the logistic equation are right. What was the logistic equation was x prime equals I don't know x times one minus x. So there's, this were the only two equilibria, zero and one. So so everything goes towards one. It cannot go towards point nine, right? Because point nine is not an equilibrium. Right? Anyway, so. Right, so as t goes to infinity, it cannot stop, it cannot, uh, it cannot approach any value less than 1. It has to approach, the limit is, it has to be 1. Okay? And it doesn't have to be logistic. I mean, it can be any function that has only two zeros here, right? Okay, so that's the first problem, and uh, well, um, second problem just says a planar system, so that's a two-dimensional system, um, and it's asking you to uh, basically find linearization around the origin, um, determine stability. I guess we're using linearization and then using the Lyapunov function. Okay. And as always, the role of the Lyapunov function is usually is more than just proving uh, stability. It's also to give you a sense of the size of the basin of attraction. So that's um, going to ask you how to how to compute. I mean, it's going to ask you to compute the basin of attraction for the origin. And feel free to use the you know face I mean the um, um, face portrait, but um, actually I just heard that that's not available. Let me see. Hmm. Or maybe this is available. Hopefully, let's let's see because. I mean, you should you, you should always kind of get an idea of the uh, the, um, the face portrait from from the P plane, I guess. Okay. Any questions on this one? Number two. Okay. Number three is. Uh, Okay, so it works. Okay, so for number three, um, it's not a system, but it's a it's a second order equation. So um, so you can be written down as a system of two first order equations, um, and your task is to show that that system is Hamiltonian. And and why? Uh, why, um, how do you show something is Hamiltonian? Hmm. So you test that, uh, that's, um, So dx dt is f. Actually, doesn't a prove it? <laughs> huh? Doesn't a prove it? <laughs> no, you're looking at a different one. Oh, one? Number three. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, we're talking. We're going to talk about number four. So, um, is Hamiltonian if there exists? H, a function, the Hamiltonian function, so that f is partial of h with respect to y and g is minus partial of h with respect to x. Okay, so necessarily, 
if it is a Hamiltonian, then partial of f with respect to x plus partial of g with respect to y is zero, right? But that's not enough. Okay, that is not enough. I mean, it's not enough because uh, because of that situation where you don't have a simply connected region, and that's the next problem. But so this one. You also have to check what? That the region is simply connected. And what's the region in problem number three? So also need to check whether um, the region, the domain where f and g are defined, continuous, and differentiable is simply connected or not. <laughs> okay, if it is, then you can proceed to compute H by integration. Right? I mean, like we did before. But if it's not, then you have to be careful. Because uh, you, may, you, may you may have a system that's not Hamilton at hand. Okay? So, back to my original question, how do you show, I mean, how do you show that a, or what's the easiest way to show that a system is Hamiltonian? Is if you can find a, ham a function whose derivatives are what they are here. I mean, the, the, with respect to y is f and with respect to x is minus g. Okay. Um, so, anyway, I think, well, this is Hamiltonian, and you can find it by checking, you know, some the connected domain. So no holes, right? And um, <clears throat> and uh, and then get h by integrating both equations one at a time, right? Actually, we did we did this last time, right? So h you integrate with respect to y this. And you get a constant that depends on x, which you can find from the second. Right? So this um, is actually called. So if you if you if you encounter this in the future, it's going to be called conservative. Equation, because there is because it has a conserved quantity. That's called the Hamiltonian. Well, that's that's exactly the Hamilton. The I'm sorry. That's going to be the energy of the of this. Uh, of the, of the trajectories. Okay, so your task is to be able to find this Hamiltonian for this very specific example. Then, basically, do the same thing for the general example, right? Uh, where you have just a smooth function here. So, and uh, lastly, is if this if this is sine, then this is the nonlinear pendulum, right? That's a nonlinear pendulum. So. You know what the energy is in that case, so you can compare the, your computation. Um, the question is, how, do, how does this compare with um, this system? What's what's well, let's first. I'm going to write these three systems here, and uh, 
what's the relation between these three? So, so this what's the relation between the first two? <coughs> if you write them as systems. Yeah, so this is the linearization of this one around the origin, right? Around zero, zero. So this is not linear, but what's what's the relation between this uh, and the, the first two? Well, you can see sine, you know, um, it has this... Taylor expansion, right? So basically, you see that the, the point is that you, when you have a nonlinear system, if if it's just totally intractable, so it's just impossible to do anything with it, then you could kind of, well, you could try to linearize it, but maybe that doesn't give you too much information, right? Then maybe you can. Is to replace the nonlinearity with a Taylor polynomial, for instance. Right. So do do a, a different approximation of that, right. and look at instead of look at that say original system, look at this simplified one. Well, that's still nonlinear, so it's not very simple. But anyway, so the question is, what's the relation between those two? And the face portrait will tell you exactly that. Um, relationship. And of course you could go one more, right? Um, hold on. Shouldn't this be three factorial? Yeah. Yeah, it certainly should be. Um, okay. All right. Well. Um, well, you can still compare the two systems. Okay. So that's that's not. course, near the origin, nothing nothing changes, right? The only thing that changes, so maybe do over six if you want. You know, um, doesn't make much difference. So, yeah, I think it's okay. So it's three factor. Um, no, I mean it's. It won't change much either. Yeah. So. Uh, number four is that situation, and I mentioned last time, um, so I just, remember I said last time that there is there are systems that appear to be, well, not appear, but they um, can satisfy the property that the partial of this you know, when you do the test for grad like gradient systems, that this function f and g satisfies partial of f with respect to y is partial of g with respect to x. Okay, but I I had y and x, and it shouldn't be y; it should be minus y. Okay, so that's very important. I I fixed it on the on the previous lecture notes. Okay. Should it not be dx and dy there? No, it should be like that. Okay. So, all right. So the f the first point is to do uh, you know differentiation quotient rule, okay, and um, verify this. But still, can you conclude that it's it's gradient system simply based on that? 
I mean, if you were, you would, you would be wrong because this system is not, not gradient. Okay? How do you prove it's not gradient? Okay. That's what the question is. Okay? Uh, prove it's not a gradient system. So it doesn't come from a gradient of a function. But it actually is Hamiltonian. It turns out to be Hamiltonian. Even though, I mean, to be Hamiltonian necessarily, this has to equal zero, uh, zero right? The sum, the, this is called a divergence of that. Um, vector field, right? F and G. So this, uh, this this turns out to be zero. Which is a necessary condition for the system to be Hamiltonian, right? But is it sufficient? In other words, simply that, sh that uh, guarantees that it's Hamiltonian? No, just like before, like the earlier one, right? This one there's no guarantee it's it's gradient and it's not gradient. This doesn't guarantee it's Hamiltonian, but it actually turns out to be Hamiltonian. So how do you show it? It's Hamiltonian. Well, what I say here, explicitly computing a Hamiltonian function. Okay. And again, I mean, the face portrait should should be uh, should help. So you know, always uh, th that's always a tool, even though it may not be approved or you know something to just say, oh yeah, here's in the face portrait. So I got the answer, but uh, don't be shy to use it. And last problem is. Um, It's still up, uh, in the plane, although I was very tempted to do it like in 3D or 4D. Um, because we've talked about linear systems in any dimension, right? So it could be 3D, 4D, and so forth. Um, but this is a linear system, so you can actually um, make an, I mean, perturb the system. For instance, I mean, you can perturb them in diff many different ways, but that would be just one way of doing it. And um, so consider that. And what this is is the length of the vector square. Okay? So, I mean, you can write this as, actually, I suggest you write this as, a, you know, as a, the usual x prime and y prime. So do write that. Uh, and then you'll see something familiar. Um, and I, I, I just picked the case when the matrix A is of that form. So what is that form called? Canonical form and complex con complex conjugate uh, roots with the real part negative. So that's the solution of the linear system is going to be are going to be spiraling in. Okay. Of course, if you have more than two dimensions, then you know everything can happen. Question is, you know, how does that extra term affect the, you know, the dynamics? Okay. So obviously, you see, when alpha, when lambda is positive, there is some. You know, the, the direction field is kind of towards zero, right? Because we said it's spiraling in. But then it's kind of, there's an additional f factor that is trying to pull it away, right? Because it's a positive, well, it's, it's, uh, it's in the direction of x if lambda is positive. Okay? So you can think of this as, you know, I have, you know, for the linear system, it looks like this, right? So if this is x, 
then this is AX. Yeah? And now with, with this additional term, what you have is you have um, what is some lambda in the direction of x, right? So the resultant is somewhere here, but it's not clear depending how big, how big lambda is, right? Because this length is magnitude is kind of uh, depending on lambda, right? So anyway, you can kind of see that um, lambda being a factor in, you know, how where is the solution going as t goes to infinity? So I think um, let's see. Yeah. Oh, anyway, so the question is, the, the, what kind of bifurcations occur where? When lambda is the parameter, I mean a, alpha and beta are constants, so they're they're set. But um, last last point says you know if if alpha is zero, then you have not spiraling in, but you have basically circle, you know, periodic solutions. Um, and when it, when you add that extra term, what happens? You know, do you still have bifurcations and all of that? So. Um, any questions on this? So I just chose to write the system like in one one line, but again it's just x prime and y prime. So you can if you feel more comfortable with that, you can write it like that. Okay? Um, so I think the only thing that's left well, um, before talking about applications is um, is one one important theorem one um, result that is kind of you know um, almost like a fundamental theorem of I don't know of ordinary differential equation um, in the plane so um, so let's talk about chapter ten. So, so far we focused on equilibrium, and we talked about Lyapunov function in the neighborhood of an equilibrium, right? And we said the equilibrium can be um, stable, unstable, or asymptotically stable, right? So, now the question is, so let me, let me do this, so... Um, so this is asymptotically stable equilibrium, but if it happens that the system in the plane again um, happens to have a um, closed orbit and it sort of attracts solutions as t goes to infinity. So solutions kind of spiral in towards that, uh, that uh, uh, closed orbit. Then it's natural to you know, call that asymptotically stable um, periodic solution, right? periodic orbit, if you like. But, of course, the, the complication is that it's possible that it's going towards uh, the uh, periodic solution.
from the outside, but from the inside it may not, right? So to be really asymptotically stable, you you want it to be from both sides, right? So you want it to be going uh, on both directions. So maybe I'll call this. Okay. So we'd like to kind of study this. When is when it does it? When does this occur? And what are the you know? Um, properties of, of such 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 solutions, such periodic orbits. Um, okay. One thing is clear, if if you have this uh, situation then um, well in the, in the equilibrium case, let's call the equilibrium to be X star and the periodic orbit to be gamma. So if I have the equilibrium to be x star, then asymptotically stable means the omega limited set of any point in the neighborhood of that po point is x star. It's, it's a single, single ton, it's a point. Whereas here, so this is for x in the basin of attraction of x star. Right? So it's a similar concept here is that you have for nearby initial conditions um, the omega limit set for all for um, all x star in x not in a neighborhood of a periodic orbit. Okay? So what would be a neighborhood? Well, we know what a neighborhood of a point is. A neighborhood of a point is any open set that contains a, a point, right? So a neighborhood can be, you know, pretty regular, but at least it has to have a, a ball, uh, I mean, a, a ball of positive radius included in it, right? So what would be a neighborhood for, for a closed orbit? Closed orbit. And it's open. So at any point would be attracted to it. Yeah, but I mean just forget the dynamical system. Just I have, I have a closed orbit. I have a closed loop. Um, a neighborhood is just any open set that contains a li li that, that closed orbit. Okay. It's just going to have at least. In the, it's going to have. You can kind of fit. Basically. Um, balls of a small radius, right, in the neighborhood that cover the whole orbit. Okay? So this is not a global um, property, but, you know, it can, um, it can be, you know, depending on the basin of attraction for that closed, closed orbit, um, it, can, it, it can be, you know, bigger or smaller depending on the system. Okay? So, um, so really, the, the goal here is to to uh, get to this uh, Poincaré, Bendixson uh, theorem, Bendixson theorem, and. Um, I'd like to kind of state it before we, you know, we kind of build on on uh, the tools needed. But I'd like to kind of state the goal here. Um, so the theorem says the following thing: it says that for a planar dynamical system, you know, smooth and all that. Um, if omega is a closed um, and bounded um, omega, well, okay, omega limit set 
also should be non-empty. Which contains no no equilibrium points. Then omega itself is a closed orbit. So So basically it says that if I start if I start somewhere, you know, if I, if I have one solution starting at some point and then approaching you know has has approaching points or visiting points as t goes to infinity but never never visit an equilibrium point okay so stay away from equilibrium points then the those points align in a closed orbit so there is no um, so there is you know if if this is where the equilibrium points are right so somehow i know the equilibrium points that's easy easy to figure out, right, for a nonlinear system. Even for, for a nonlinear system, it's relatively easy. Um, but if if my omega limit points are just, um, don't, don't include this point, so it's, you know, then automatically this is an orbit. Okay. Actually, the other way around. Um, Right. And of course, this solution is going to actually spiral in towards that that's that orbit. Okay. So that's uh, that's the the theorem. That's the statement, and it doesn't apply to three-dimensional systems. For three-dimensional systems, you have freedom to move in three dimensions so uh, even though you might not be approaching any of the equilibria you might be going like crazy um, so the omega limit set is not necessarily you know closed orbit like this going back and forth I mean going and go, uh, coming around uh, being a periodic solution okay? so that's um, that's the sort of the, um, the, main, the main theorem in this um, planar systems. What are, what are some of the implications of this? Just, just on a point, um, a few. For instance, um, Some of the consequences, and again, I'll, 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 we'll we'll do the proof of this theorem, and we'll do we'll do the proof of, of the consequences. But just to to uh, kind of motivate or justify this is um, if I have a dynamical system, um, and I have a set K, which is a compact. Uh, compact set which is positively invariant so what does that mean what does it mean positively invariant once you get in you never go ex escape right so it stays always in that set what does it mean compact really means bounded 
and uh, closed. Okay. So anything that's bounded it means that it's 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 not escape going to infinity. Closed means what? If you take the limits, if you, the limits of sequences in that set are also in that set, right? So if it's, you know, it, it contains this boundary, if you like. Um, okay, so if this is the case, then uh, K has either, has at least, well, has at least um, an equilibrium point or a periodic orbit. Inside, okay? So all you have to do is to kind of um, figure out You know, given your system, to say, okay, I have this, I, I found this box where I know that things that come in never go uh, escape. So that's done by looking at the direction field, right? And saying direction field points inward. Then the conclusion is that there is e there is either a uh, equilibrium point, right? And if there is no equilibrium point, there is a there is a there is a periodic solution. Okay. What is the consequence of that statement above? Well, all you have to do is to kind of trace one solution going in, right? I don't know, let's say X0 starts when it's um, when it hits this region, right? Then it goes in. Then what can happen? Well, the omega limit set is not empty, right? So omega limit set here There, there, there are points uh, that are that are visited by this uh, solution infinitely often. Okay, I guess that's why. Why is that? Well, that's the property of of a compact set, a bounded closed set. That if you have a sequence, just take a sequence of of values of times, and and then the solution at that times. You have that sequence that stays bounded. It has a subsequence that is convergent, and it ha so therefore it has a limit. At least on a subsequence, there is a limit, right? So this is not empty. And of course, you take those all the limits of the subsequences, and you create the omega limit set, right? So you have a um, a set here which is non-empty. Is bounded because it's inside a box, right? And it's closed. Why is this closed? You see, all of this are important here. Why, why is the omega limit set closed? Closed means again what? If you have a, a sequence of points in that set that has a limit, then the limit is also in that set. I think I deserve some
some uh, some discussion. I mean, I don't know if you guys care too much, but it's this is this is actually part of. I mean, if if um, those properties don't hold, then you you actually cannot make those conclusions. Okay, but it turns out that in the plane, everything it happens um, naturally. Okay. Um, so anyway, this actually is is a property of, of omega limit sets that it's they're always closed sets. So let's see why is that the case. Um, anyway, once with that that is verified, so I have a non-empty closed and bounded omega limit set. Then and I have no and it doesn't contain any any um, equilibrium points, right? then it must be a closed orbit. So then it must be, you know, this solution must approach this orbit. I mean, the omega limit set is, is a, uh, itself, you know, it goes like that, right? So why do we care about these things so much? I mean, they uh, turns out that we'd like to know for for I mean for uh, dynamical systems you'd like to know if there are periodic solutions or if there are periodic um, well limit sets, right? You'd like to know that um, if you start you know if you start somewhere to um, have a limit limiting behavior that, that, that looks periodic. Okay, um, I guess that's I don't know came from uh, planetary motion where you know you'd like to know that we're going in a periodic orbit and that things won't change, right? Um, so the, knowing whether you have periodic solutions or not, it's kind of um, it's 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 of interest, and what happens is I think there's even an open question even in the plane um, that if I have a planar system, to locate all periodic solutions. Um, even uh, when f and g are polynomials, locate and count the number of periodic solutions. This is this is uh, I believe an open question. That is, remember we talked about x, x cubed, x, x squared, and so forth. What if it's like uh, some combination of powers of x and y? Right? You would think that you you should be able to figure out where all the periodic solutions are, right? Well, you don't if, if the, po I mean, you don't have a systematic way of doing it if, even if this, uh, you know, polynomial degree, or degree five or something. Um, This one that you see here, like the one that comes up, is is a polynomial, right? In each x and y, um, and you kind of see, um, well, you kind of see one. Well, there is no periodic solution there. I think there is a homoclinic homo orbit, right? That uh, starts at zero, ends at zero. But if it's this is because I have x square and, and it's it's a polynomial of deg degree two only, right? But if it's a if you have a polynomial of, of, de of higher degree, like two um, x minus x cubed minus y cubed or something like that, um, x minus 
x squared times y. You see, just understanding the, looks like there's lots of uh, equilibria here, right? So I have one here, I have one here, and I have one here, right? So finding the equilibria is not a big deal, right? Because you just, well, you just set the right-hand side equal to zero, and you, you have some algebraic equations at hand, right? But how about periodic solutions? I mean, how do you know that, you know, maybe some, well, how do you know that there are or there are not, not periodic solutions? Okay, you, okay. So it has to be done on a kind of an individual case, case by case. In one of the applications that's going to come up in Chapter 12, I believe, we talk about Van der Paul system. It's it's polynomial. And we spend the whole, basically, it's a typical example, but it's, a, it's an example where there is a periodic solution and it has a meaning in electrical circuits. Right? Uh, but the moment you change that system, again, you have to uh, focus on, you know, are there periodic solutions? Because they don't, they don't really, they are not really um, uh, transparent from the equations themselves, right? You see, you can, you have periodic solutions if it's a Hamiltonian, right? If the system were Hamiltonian, then you know that, um, well, you know that the solutions are preserve H. So H is constant like the solutions, right? So the solutions are on the direction, on the um, level curves. So if the level curves are closed, then you have periodic solutions, right? But what if it's not Hamiltonian, right? That could happen that you have one or maybe two periodic solutions. Um, let's see, I can make up one that has two periodic solutions. Well, not two, but Uh, let's say H is X fourth plus Y fourth plus um, so minus 2X squared Y squared. Is that right? No, minus 2XY, I think. So the partial with respect to, to y is um, minus 2x plus 4y. Well, let's do divided by 4 so it's easier. So it's y cubed and partial of h with respect to x is uh, minus 2y plus x cubed. So you see that's a cubic polynomial, right? So now I'm going to have minus 2x plus um, y cubed and 2y minus x cubed. Is that right? Yeah, but I'm doing Hamiltonian, so I have to put a minus in front of 2y minus x cubed. Now, it's Hamiltonian, so there are lots of, lots of, lots of them, right? And there's going to be, uh, these are the level curves of that function, right? And basically, every every single solution is a periodic solution, right? So these are the kind of the. Um, um, there's just a numerical error, right? So exact, I mean, it should be an exact solution, not, not um, expanding like this. Okay? <laughs> but um, 
again, you may, you may have a non-Hamiltonian system that has just like three cycles. Okay? And then five equilibrium points and so forth. Uh, if it doesn't like to stop, I think you can force it. Hmm? There was a stop with a button. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> okay. So um, again, locating the all periodic solutions for non-Hamiltonian systems is basically what's difficult. Okay. And um, again, we're going to spend time on, on specific examples. And I think some of you that chose those um, um, projects are, are actually going to um, see these things. Um, <clears throat> and we're not going to talk, I mean, we're not going to be attempting to characterize, you know, or, or count the number of periodic solutions. For a, for a given system, um, so that's not our intent. But I think that should give you sort of an idea why this is uh, important. You have this you, uh, solutions either go to an equilibrium or go to a to a periodic solution. So if if it doesn't go to an equilibrium, then those periodic solutions are um, lomica limit sets. Okay, so so back to the question: Why is the omega limit set a closed set? Hmm? It uses definition, but you need to. I mean, the definition is says that omega limit set in this in R n. Okay. Um, for some sequence, right? <coughs> so, but now the question is, if I have a sequence of z n. Or ZK, Z1, Z2, ZK. If if these all belong to to the omega limit set of a, of the initial condition X naught, and let's say Z infinity is the limit of this ZKs. Why is the infinity also in the omega limit set? That's what it means to be closed. It means you, you take a sequence from that set, and that converges to some some number, some uh, point, and then that point also belongs to the omega limit set. It's probably intuitive, but. Um, so I have this is uh, this is z infinity, right? And I know z's. I'm going to use them with I don't know. Z ten, right? I don't know z k. Z one, z two. So they converge to this value, right? But what do I know? What do we know about each z? Well, each z is actually is an is a is an omega limit point for this for the trajectory of x naught, right? So x naught is you know initial condition, and this is x of t, right? So x of t visits each z infinitely often, right? So all you have to do is to say, well, maybe z1 is not so important, but maybe as you get close to this z infinity, I'm going to I'm going to take what? Take 
a value of, of t for which x of t is close to zk, right? Take another value of t for which is close to zk plus 1. And so forth. So what's going to happen? You're going to be able to find, I don't know, x, t, k, that's in the neighborhood of zk, right? And then zk plus 1 and so forth. So what's going to happen is one can find tk go into infinity such that closeness is, is really uh, measured by distance, right? Distance from zk to x of tk is less than what? could be like 1 over 2 to the k, something that goes to 0 as well, right? Why is that again? Because the, each zk is in the omega limit set of x, right? So you can find such a t so that this distance is less than 1 over 2k, and then let k go to infinity. Conclusion is, zk goes to z infinity, so it means the limit of x of tk is z infinity. So z infinity is also in the omega limit set. Okay. So that's always closed. Um, uh, of course, assuming it's not empty, because if it's empty, how can it be empty? How can a set be empty? For a solution, if it's if it just goes to infinity, there's no limit point, right? How can it be? Unbo uh, so, so the other thing was, can uh, the omega limit set be unbounded in general, even for a planar system? Can you imagine a system that approaches something, but it's that something is not bounded? I think that's one of the exercises which I didn't assign, but can it be a line, for instance? A whole line. Can it be a whole line? How? Let's say I start at x0 and I go... like this, right? I don't self-intersect, right? Do you agree that the, this vertical line is uh, is the omega limit set of the solution? Yeah? Because each point is approached by... And if, I'm sorry, I should... This should also grow, so it's... So you can write a, f a function, a formula that does that, right? But it's unbounded, right? So this can happen. So the Poincaré theorem has all those ingredients that are, um, you know, um, you know, make 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 sense. Uh, closed, bounded, and non -em non empty. Okay? So it kind of avoids the other pathological cases. Um, so Monday, what I'll do is I'll I'll go through the proof of this and kind of. Um, see more of the consequences, so including proofs of this of the, of the statements. Okay, and um, again, I'm hoping you're going to be done with the exam by Monday. But if you need one extra day, that's fine. Um, any questions? Um, for the exam, I mean. Um, okay, yeah, I can do that. Um, I'll email you when I have that. Okay. okay. Um, yeah. I just had a question. When you put it up on the board, you wrote it as y x minus one third x cubed. But wouldn't it have been minus the quantity of that, so it would be reversed? 
really why you can't create the Hamiltonian. Right. I, I think you can create the Hamiltonian either way, but. but for this one. Yeah, this, you're, you're right. Board, you're wrong. wrong, okay. Um, I also have for the grad students that those um, initial, but, uh, initial reports, so let me return. But I'll, what I'd like to, um, to do is kind of have a chance to talk to each of you about um, this report and how, how it should progress. All right, so I don't know, maybe set an appointment with me or um, in the next week or so after the exam. And, and can you bring this back with you? Because I don't, I didn't make a copy, so. Um, thank you. Well, I was at one point, I just hadn't gotten to it yet. <laughs>